Okay, I think we will kick off. We've got lots of people in the room and I wanted to give you a very warm welcome to this webinar on how to develop pre-service teacher education for foundational literacy and numeracy. And as I'm sure um, many of you will know, this is part of a wider series of events launching RTI International's how-to guides on the teaching of foundational literacy and numeracy. And we're really pleased to have, have so many join us um, at what I know can be a very busy time of year as well as we approach the end of the year um, to talk about pre-service teacher education. Um, just at, by introduction, my name is Alice Cornish. I'm a director at Better Purpose in London, and I'm very pleased to host today's webinar, um, but also to be supporting RTI with the dissemination of these really useful resources. And of course, um, the purpose of, of us meeting today is to talk about the latest guide. So I'd love to draw your attention to the links at the top of the page in front of you, which you can use to access the Science of Teaching site, which we really hope that you do. There's some fantastic resources on a range of different topics, including, of course, on, on pre-service teacher education. Now, before I pass over to my colleagues at RTI International and the Gates Foundation to introduce today's session formally, I wanted to take the liberty of, of finding out a little bit more about who's in the room today. Um, and to do that, I've got a very short poll that hopefully is going to pop up on your screens so that we can find out a little bit more about who's in the room with us and who's joining us in this conversation. So. The first question that I wanted to ask was, um, where are you all dialing in from today? Some of you may have already introduced yourselves in the chat, um, but please do respond to the poll. Hopefully you're able to, to see that now. Okay, has everyone had a chance to do that? Fantastic. Do we have any results? Where can we find out where people are from? Ah, okay. So no one has stayed awake from, from Australia, which I'm, I'm pleased to see. Hopefully they're getting a good night's sleep. Quite a few people having, a couple of people having a, a late night in Asia. Thank you so much for, for staying awake and, and joining us today. Lots of people in Europe, a few early starts in North, North America, quite a few people. Um, a few people in sub-Saharan Africa as well, which is fantastic. So that's really interesting and, and great to get to know you a little bit more. Um, my next question is um, finding out a little bit more about the roles and the, the sorts of expertise that we have in the room. So maybe we could launch our second question to find out more about you. Oh, so I think that's the old poll. So we, our second question is, where do you work? We had to include this one about in a school because I think so many people on the call probably have been teachers or, or been in the classroom at some point in their career and, and we consider them the lucky ones. Okay, should we see what the results say? Okay, so lots of lots of people from NGOs or INGOs, some researchers, um, five people from colleges of education, which is great. You're very welcome. And we're pleased to have that expertise in the room today. Quite a few funders as well. I'd love to know where some, some of those people who ticked somewhere else um, are coming from as well. But let's go on to our third question. So this is not a test, but we did want to find out. We were curious to see how many people have already read the guide that we're talking about today. So you may have seen the link already. You may um, have it on your bedtime reading list. Hopefully there's no one answering what guide and doesn't know quite what, what the session is about today. Okay, let's see. Great, so lo lots of people who've not had a chance to read it yet, um, but it's on their reading list, which is brilliant, or they've had a quick look, um, but not read in detail. There'll be lots of opportunity today to hear from the authors to learn more about what's in those guides. 
and hopefully to um, to whet your appetite to, to go away and, and read them when you've got a little bit more time um, over the next few weeks. So my last question is um, a little bit more about the expertise that people have in the room around pre-service teacher education. So we're quite keen to know whether people are quite new to this subject, whether they're more expert, whether they're here to learn. So what do you bring around pre-service teacher education as you come into today's webinar? Okay, shall we take a look? Great, so the majority of people uh, know a little bit about the subject, but are here to learn. That's what we're here for. We're really pleased to see that. Fantastic to see some experts in the room as well. If you are an expert and you've got insights and reflections, we really do want you to share them through the chat today and um, through your questions, really sort of help us, help us develop our understanding and our learning together on, on this subject. Well, thank you. You're all very welcome. That's the, that's the end of my poll um, today. And I wanted to now kick off formally and pass over to Dr. Wendy Rallingita from RTI International, and then to Dr. Asya Kazmi from the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation to start with a few words of welcome. Dr. Rallingita is who I'll come to first. Um, Dr. Rallingita is the principal investigator for this how-to guide series and a lead author on, on many of the guides themselves. She's going to be introducing today's topic um, and also we're gonna be welcoming her back a little bit later during the session to lead our panel discussion today. So over to Wendy. Thank you so much, Alice. And um, I, that was a really interesting poll. I was very glad to see nobody said not yet and not interested. So that was a good, a good start. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, everyone. Um, thank you, welcome, and thank you so much for uh, joining us, taking time to join us today on what I think is going to be a very interesting conversation on a really important topic. Um, I think it, probably as many of us um, on this call today, my passion and interest in teacher professional development uh, started when I was a teacher. Um, taking methods classes, uh, doing practicum, uh, you know, as a student, as well as attending various in-service trainings as a teacher and, and receiving ongoing support and realizing how important um, all of that professional development was uh, for me to grow as a teacher. And then as a teacher educator, I've been able to be involved in a number of different interventions and programs aimed at uh, strengthening foundational literacy and numeracy. A lot of them have really focused primarily on in-service training and increasingly ongoing support, all of which are important, but it's also important to, to, to look at that foundation step, the, 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 the first step in the continuing um, professional development cycle. And whenever we're concerned about sustainability, that's also where that's gonna come, that, that strong foundation. So I think this is a very important topic and, and I'm very grateful that the Gates Foundation gave us the opportunity to develop this guide, um, as, well as, to, as well as to convene this event. And we'll have a couple of the authors from the um, pre-service guide that are going to be taking us through and introducing us to that. And I hope at some time you'll have a chance to, that QR code is still on the screen that can take you to the site where, where the guide is. So you can also have a look. And then following um, the author speaking, we'll have a panelist of experts um, working in pre-service teacher education and be able to hear about their experiences and the different contexts they work in. Um, so I think it's gonna be a, a very exciting and, and interesting um, couple of hours. And just to mention when we were talking with some of the panelists about this event and we're talking about what is what do we hope to achieve here? And yes, we're launching these guides and we want everyone to, we, we feel that they'll be useful and want everybody to um, have a look and, and use them going into the future. But also um, I hope that this can be the launch of a conversation and the launch of connection um, between people who are working um, in different ways. We saw there's people from all over the world in a number of different roles, all working to support foundational literacy and numeracy. So I hope this is a start. Today is a start of a conversation of how to strengthen pre-service teacher education 
um, that will then lead to you know, improved instruction and support foundational literacy and numeracy. So with that, thank you all again for coming and we can get started with the conversation. I think I, I will turn it to um, Alice or Asya. <laughs> so that's great, thank you, Wendy. Um, so we're now gonna pass over to Dr. Asya Kazmi, who's the Global Education Policy Lead at the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation, who, as Wendy's told us, um, have been supporting this work. And um, Asya, I'd, I'd like you to add a few words of welcome as well. Thank you very much, Alice, and, and thank you, Wendy. Um, I want to introduce myself by saying that I'm a teacher of mathematics, and I've also studied, um, so my doctorate was on the teaching and learning of mathematics, and I've inspected initial teacher education in England. If we think of teaching as a four-stage process, you've got the selection of who enters the profession, and what we have is a sense of um, what we don't necessarily have is what are the intrinsic personal attributes that we should be looking for at the recruitment stage um, that, that signals that these, uh, these are the kind of um, recruits who are going to make effective teachers. We need to understand that better. But given that 70 million teachers, there's a shortage that is needed according to UNESCO, this is an important thing to focus on. The second stage is the training of those, um, of those recruits, how they are trained to acquire the knowledge and skills they need to hit the ground running. Um, then is the uh, case of deployment. Where are they sent to teach and are, has equity been taken into consideration? So rural remote areas, how are we um, incentivizing teachers to go into these areas? And then finally, once you are a teacher, there's that ongoing professional development that teachers need. And in the global education sector, particularly in literacy, as Wendy said, we have a better understanding of what works here, the coaching aspect, teachers learning together. So it's the first three sections that this um, session um, focuses on. And the literature review um, that some of, many of you are going to look at later is a depressing read. Um, the focus is on content um, of te um, teacher development of content as opposed to practice, and even that content hasn't made um, much of a difference according to the evidence. And there's insufficient program focus on practice, and teacher trainers are also not adequately supported. So I want to talk about three things in particular. Teachers need the knowledge of what to do. They need the practice in doing it and they need the right motivation to keep doing it and getting better at teaching it. So knowledge, I'm inspired by Shulman's work who talks about seven kinds of knowledge that teachers need. Um, and if we just look at three of those, the content knowledge, the general pedagogical knowledge, it is the combination of those in a subject specific focus, the pedag pedagogical content knowledge, that is the unique sphere of teachers that has the greatest impact. So I may know how to do mathematics, that gives me content, but actually how to teach mathematics is that unique knowledge that teachers have. And we know when we develop that, um, there is greater impact on learning. And then the second aspect is practice. That knowledge needs to be learned in situation, in the classrooms and in classrooms that teachers are going to actually be teaching in. So the craft of teaching is refined through practice. In my own teacher training, nothing was as memorable as when I was actually observing great teachers or when I was discussing with them what they were doing, why they were doing it and my own ideas. And best of all, practicing that teaching and getting that feedback. And it's something that's needed at all levels. But just to signal how complicated or how complex what teachers do is, in 1929, a list of teacher activities was recorded and there was a thousand activities that teachers do that was listed. Later efforts have been on refining that list and getting down to core activities and supporting that initial teacher education, that pre-teacher education in um, focusing on those core activities, amongst which for primary school teachers, is the ability to teach literacy and the ability to teach numeracy, but how to make it so it's engaging, joyful, and that children's wider um, development, how they're respectful, curious, have a, learn, have a love of learning is also engaged. The third aspect is the motivation. So if you have the, um, the knowledge, you've practiced it, 
teachers when they close their classroom door, if they have a classroom door, are um, the kings of their classroom. And they need um, intrinsic motivation and some extrinsic motivation that enables them to practice their, um, their craft of teaching, um, to learn new skills and apply those skills. And um, the literature review talks about teaching becoming a low prestige option. Um, and sad to hear as a teacher when you also know that in many of the cultures that we work in, teaching was placed in a, as a, um, on a pedestal. It's more than just a profession. It was a spiritual um, calling. My own research showed this. So we need to reclaim this. And part of that reclamation is to be proud of the fact that we are teachers and to state it. And secondly, to demonstrate the difference that we make to children's outcomes, both learning and wider. But if outcomes are low, like in Sub-Saharan Africa, where nine out of 10 children cannot do, um, cannot read by the age of 10, our prestige will remain low. So we need to be self-critical about what we do, how we do it, and to do it better. Finally, there's a science to teaching, and hence the name of this program. But there's also a science to adult learning. And while we don't know as much as we ought to as the literature review um, for this um, um, unit tells us, what we do know is, um, isn't that uplifting, but today we'll hear from those who are contributing to improve practice, who are pushing that boundary. And the key to, um, um, to more effective pre-service um, pre education is to grow this body of knowledge, share it and apply it. So our teachers, our early career teachers are better equipped to carry the profession forward. Um, I wonder if you'd indulge me um, for a few minutes where we know as teachers, um, we make a difference and can make a huge difference. So this clip of Adele, the megastar, being reunited with her teacher at 12 years old, I find inspiring and it shows the power of teachers. Thank you so much, Asi. I think that was a, um, it always makes, it really wells me up. And I think that explains really well why in that poll we had, if you're in the classroom, you are the lucky one because you get to, make that enormous difference to people's lives. So thank you for, um, for, for sharing that with us. And I'm afraid we don't have Ed Adele live today to um, participate in the rest of, rest of the webinar, but we have a wonderful lineup for you nonetheless. Um, but before we move through to the main sessions, just a few housekeeping points from me. Um, so uh, there are two ways that you can contribute to today's session through the Q&A button on the, the bottom of your Zoom panel, you, you can see that there's a, an icon saying Q&A that you can use to write questions um, and also in the Zoom chat. So for any questions to the authors or the other speakers that we have today, please direct these directly through the Q&A um, and we'll try to answer as many of these live as possible, either through written answers or um, in the conversations that we're having with our speakers. The chat is not for questions. The chat is there for your reflections, your comments, additions, some of the experts that we have in our room and, and everyone um, on this call who brings so much varied experience and expertise. You know, we want to hear from you. We want you to, to use that chat, chat to add your um, reflections and additions there. Um, so please feel very welcome to, to use the chat to participate today. Um, so that you know, uh, today's presentation is being recorded um, and it will be available afterwards as well um, for you to have your own records, but also we really encourage you to share this with your networks as well. Um, and then finally, once again, um, we encourage you to note down somewhere if you've got a, a piece of paper to hand or a mobile phone where you can capture the QR code, you can see that we have the link to the guide with a QR code, um, please do go on the Science of Teaching website. There's so much useful resources for, for you there. So without further ado, on to our first main session for today. And I'm very pleased to introduce you to two of the guide authors, Dr. Stephanie simmons wilkowski and Dr. Patience Sower, who are gonna walk you through the guide. 
So Stephanie is the Associate Director of the Learning Systems Institute and Associate Professor of International and Multicultural Education in the Department of Education Leadership and Policy Studies at Florida State University. Her research focuses on improving basic education in Sub-Saharan Africa, including school quality, early literacy outcomes, and pre-service teacher education. She's the project director for the USAID Transforming Teacher Education Activity in Zambia, and has also worked in Nigeria, Kenya, Tanzania, Madagascar, Ethiopia, and Sierra Leone, among other countries. Patience is Senior Literacy and Language Advisor at RTI International and plays a key role in RTI International education projects. Born in Ghana, West Africa, she's lived and worked in multicultural and multicultural, uh, multilingual contexts in Africa, the Middle East, Asia and North America. Her experience includes teacher education accreditation, program management and coordination, and the development of strategies to improve educational outcomes. Dr. Sowa is passionate about strengthening research in and developing forms of bilingual teaching and learning for school children in low and middle income countries, particularly as they transition from mother tongue education in the early grades to education in international languages of teaching and learning in the upper primary grades. She's also very enthusiastic and passionate about exploring innovative ways of preparing pre-service teachers for school. So we're absolutely delighted to have both Stephanie and Patience with us today. Before I pass over to them, just a reminder that you can post your questions for Stephanie and Patience in the Q&A. And Stephanie and Patience, over to you. Great, okay, thank you, Alice. My name is Stephanie simmons Lukowski, and I'm the Associate Director of the Learning Systems Institute at Florida State University. I'm one of the authors of the pre-service teacher education how-to guide, and I'm happy to be here today with patients to present it to you. The guide is divided into four content areas. PSTE structure and curriculum, establishing a quality teaching practicum, supporting teacher educator and institutional capabilities, and improving teacher selection and deployment. Next Meetings slide, please. Oh, sorry, please, patients. I was just going to introduce myself again. That's fine, Stephanie. Hello, everyone. Greetings. My name is Patience. Go ahead. Next slide, please, Alice. Thank you. The purpose of this guide is to underline the important role played by pre-service teacher education programs and to suggest ways that they can be better leveraged to improve foundational literacy and numeracy learning in low and middle income countries. Pre-service teacher education provides the foundation that new teachers rely on in their classrooms, yet it's generally left out of large scale interventions, which instead focus on in-service teachers. As a consequence, pre-service teacher education programs are frequently disengaged from what's happening in schools, which means that new teachers enter the workforce without the skills that current foundational literacy and numeracy programs require. In this guide, we offer suggestions to policymakers, donors, implementers, and teacher educators on how to more effectively develop primary level pre-service teacher education for foundational literacy and numeracy. We also point to several areas where more research is needed to guide policy and practice. Next slide, please. The structure of PSTE programs varies widely across countries. In some countries, those who complete 10th grade but did not perform well enough to continue on to senior secondary school can enroll in teacher training programs. Increasingly, other countries are requiring a four-year college degree, even for primary teachers. The African Union's African Teacher Qualification Framework states that the minimum qualification for teachers should now be a bachelor's degree in education, though this has not yet been widely implemented in member countries due to the associated costs and logistical challenges. Regardless of their length and structure, pre-service programs should be designed to connect theory and practice. New teachers need to understand the content of the subjects they teach, how to teach specific subjects to students, and how to teach well in general, including classroom management and student engagement. The curriculum should be aligned with national standards and must prepare pre-service teachers for real classrooms, considering class sizes, resource levels, 
and student characteristics like home language diversity. Over to you, Patience. Thank you, Stephanie. I'm going to talk about uh, an essential component of a pre-service teacher education program, and that is the establishment of a quality teaching practicum. The teaching practicum is part of the pre-service teacher education program where PS pre-service teachers teach in schools under the supervision of a mentor teacher. It's been shown to be a very effective way of preparing pre-service teachers for teaching, developing their professional identities, their professional dispositions, and in all, honing their skills to get them ready for becoming beginning teachers. The research demonstrates that the stronger the teacher education practicum, the better quality of teachers countries produce. In our guide, we have several suggestions for establishing quality practica um, for pre-service teachers. One of these is intentionally placing them with quality partner schools and excellent mentor teachers who give high quality feedback. We also recommend sent, uh, setting a minimum length of duration of the practica. And this is because we realized in the literature as we were preparing the guide that some practica are as short as two weeks and as long as nine months. But the literature does indicate that the longer the practica, the better. Um, so this is another one recommendation that we would like to give. Another important suggestion we have and is ensuring that the practica are scaffolded so that pre-service teachers in their practicum learn and are provided with a growing autonomy. So for example, this would look like perhaps them starting with observing teaching, good teaching in schools, then taking on a few lessons, and then by the end of the practicum, actually taking over the classroom provide uh, preparing lessons and teaching children. We also encourage pre-service teacher education programs to nurture reflective practice while, while pre-service teachers are participating in the practicum. And to do this, we want them to support teachers and guide them to learn how to reflect and most important of all, what students are learning before, during, and after teaching. Over to you, Stephanie. Thank you, Patience. In this guide, we stress the need for greater attention to the professional development of teacher educators. Pre-service teachers will model their own teaching style on the methods they see used by their teacher educators. Given the disconnect between PSTE programs and what's happening in primary schools, this is a problem. Primary school curricula are becoming increasingly engaging and interactive, while pre-service programs remain teacher educator centered and lecture based. As one College of Education principal in Zambia told me earlier this year, her students graduate, quote, looking rusty as if they finished 20 years ago. This disconnect can lead to contradictory beliefs and approaches among new teachers. We make three recommendations in the guide to address these issues. First, PSTE programs should hire lecturers who have academic training and teaching expertise directly related to the post. Someone who has excelled as a primary grade teacher is a better fit for a primary PSTE program than someone who was a secondary school science teacher, for example. Second, teacher educators should have continuous professional development opportunities and PSTE programs should receive budgetary support for this. Third, PSTE institutions need to be resourced with current primary grades textbooks, curricula, manipulatives, and other teaching aids that are currently used in primary schools. This will allow teacher educators to stay current on what is happening in schools and to incorporate these materials into their teaching. Back over to you, patients. Thank you, Stephanie. As Asia mentioned earlier in, in her uh, introduction, teacher selection and deployment are another essential feature of pre-service teacher education. 
In our guide, we define selection as the procedures that are used to attract candidates to enter teacher education programs and deployment as the process of placing teachers both beginning and experienced into schools in various regions in country contexts. It's important to pay particular attention to pre-service teacher selection and teacher deployment policies in low and middle income countries because they can affect the quality of teachers who enter the profession and the number of teachers who stay in the profession. In, in light of this, pre-service teacher education programs we recommend need to find strategies, as um, Asia also mentioned, which include the selection of strong candidates and candidates who, um, to a certain extent, have the dispositions, the passion and the motivation to become a teacher and not enter their profession as a fallback because they didn't get high enough grades in the high stakes uh, examinations that we often have in low and middle income countries. Um, in the case of ministries of education in these countries, they need to also ensure that enough teachers are being trained for country needs, and they also need to address delays in deploying teachers to schools. Some of our suggestions that we have in the guide in terms of improving teacher selection and deployment are, first of all, conducting a needs assessment. In other words, countries need to have a sense of how many teachers they have, how many they need, which regions they should be in, even down to how, what languages the teachers speak so they can better serve the children in teaching the language of instruction in various areas. Incentives across the board are also crucial. Uh, Pre-service teachers should have scholarships, particularly scholarships that target women persons with disabilities and people who are proficient in multiple languages. For in-service teachers, there should be access to courses in career um, advancements. And they should also be given stipends if they are deployed to rural and challenging areas. And this brings up another issue. The, and this is the need for pre-service teacher education programs to expose pre-service teachers to rural schools in their practicum. And this would be in order to dispel the misconceptions that they had about teaching in these areas and also teach them how to handle the various challenges they might encounter when, if they are deployed to these schools in the future. Induction is the final suggestion we have in this um, for this feature and induction it, uh, that assists children to transition and uh, adapt to the workplace. Uh, induction programs serve to support teacher well-being and retention and the stronger programs last for more than a year. The next slide. Alice. So it may be my internet, but I'll go ahead and conclude so we can move on to our panelists. So in conclusion, in our guide, we recommend that country education stakeholders, donors, and implementers in low and middle income countries place more emphasis on the preparation of teachers. We suggest that this will lead to a more sustainable and quality teaching workforce. And to do so, we recommend in the guide that pre-service teacher education programs take a closer look at uh, the structure and curricula of pre-service teacher education programs. They establish quality teaching practica, that they support educator and institutional capabilities, and that they improve teacher selection and deployment. As Stephanie has stated, and as I'm sure you'll hear from our panelists, the lack of resources is the primary reason for many of the challenges in pre-service teacher education. 
So some of the suggestions we have for cutting down some immediate things that perhaps countries, donors, and implementers can do is involve pre-service teacher education programs in their foundational literacy and numeracy activities. So for example, they could have teacher education educators attend their teacher trainings, or they could actually train teacher educators to be master trainers and participate in the foundational literacy and numeracy programs. Another thing donors and implementers can do is to provide copies of the teaching and learning materials that foundational literacy and um, programs develop to pre-service teacher education programs so that the pre-service teachers will be familiar with these materials if they happen to be deployed to regions that are using these materials. Most of all, we need more studies to be conducted in various aspects of pre-service teacher education. In the work that Stephanie and I and our other collaborators did um, in the development of the guide, we recognized and discovered that there's a paucity of research on this topic. And so we encourage stakeholders to conduct rigorous large scale uh, research that tracks, for example, pre-service teachers over time when they become teachers, uh, what they do when they become teachers and, and their impact on student learning outcomes. Um, other areas of research could be perceived preparation for teaching, um, mentor teachers and their experiences, and the types of incentives that um, will reduce disparities in the distribution of qualified and effective teachers. So conducting research on pre-service teacher education um, in low and middle income countries is vital because these research findings can lead to the, the development of an evidence base which can inform pre-service teacher education, policy development, and reform. We hope our guide serves as a springboard to continue discussions and research to strengthen teacher education programs in low and middle income countries. Thank you. Thank you so much, Patience and Stephanie, for that really helpful walkthrough of the guides. Um, we have a few moments for some questions. Um, I can see that there's lots of chatter in the chat. Um, I'd love for, for some questions to be directed through the Q&A. But I guess sort of while, while some of those are coming up and, and people may still be thinking through what, what their reflections are and their questions are, I wanted to sort of sneak in it in there if I if I may. And I mean, one thing that really struck me in the guides is you have some um, really sort of interesting case studies from from around the world. And I wondered if um, if you would be able to share some of the kind of innovative case studies or some of those examples of programs that are doing really innovative work to um, to kind of bridge that link between. Um, you know, some of the lack of resources or the lack of focus on pre-service teacher education that has historically been a challenge. Um, you know, are there some specific examples that maybe you could share that, that are brought to life in, in the guides? Patience, I think you're on mute. Sure, please, yeah, please go ahead, Patience. Sure. Um, and I'm sure uh, Benedicta will be able to say more about this, but one of the innovative programs is, not because I'm from Ghana, but one of the innovative programs is the TTEL uh, program in Ghana, where they have worked very hard to, up, um, again, move teacher training to four-year institutions, as well as strengthen the practica. And so um, pre-service teachers go into schools, they have lengthier practica, and they are supervised by tutors to ensure that there's not too much burden on the mentor teacher, nor on the tutors who go out to school. So they're, they're doing a lot of good things. Anything from you, Stephanie, that comes to mind? I think there were several cases that came up when we were doing the background research about countries that are extending their pre-service teacher training from more vocational limited length programs to longer programs. And one uh, case that's in the guide is Myanmar, which with support from UNESCO and several donors 
uh, is moving into a four-year program for pre-service teacher education and has done a lot of uh, curriculum work and other work um, to support that and, and to make that successful. So I think that's a, a model that other countries might uh, look at following as well. Great, thanks for that. And um, as Patience says, we'll be able to explore some more of these examples through our panel. And um, we've had another question come through from Carl, um, commenting that some countries have centralized curricula for primary teacher education, which are fairly resistant to change. How do you work around this to ensure that innovation and recent developments can get into teacher training? That's a great question, Carl. I can take a first shot at that, Patience. Um, so one way that, that um, in my own work I found to be helpful is instead of trying to change the curriculum from the bottom up to look at what the strengths and weaknesses are and to try to work within existing structures. Uh, so in the Transforming Teacher Education Project in Zambia, that's the approach that we've taken. So uh, we were developing new literacy and language modules uh, that fit within the existing framework and then have some additional pieces that we felt were missing that, that were needed, but, but without uh, taking on the, 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 the Herculean task of redesigning the entire curriculum. So I think there's often uh, some flexibility to within existing frameworks to, to kind of add and to refocus without needing to, to go head on against um, something that is, uh, you know, as stated, is very difficult to change. And I would say um, um, honest collaboration so that you don't appear to be telling um, people what to do or that you're parachuting in with what you know to be best practices, but to start with what do you see as, you, what do you see your needs to be? What are your needs? How can we help you strengthen these? What options are, do you think are available? Here's some that we can share, what will work in your context. So really open, frank conversations, I think. Great, thank you for that. And I think that probably um, leads us nicely into our next session, our panel conversation, where we'll be digging a little bit deeper into some particular programs and, and some work that's happening in different colleges of, of education. And um, so Stephanie and Patience, thank you so much for joining us for the walkthrough and for leading us, giving us that little sneak peek of, of what's in the guides. I'm sure you will encourage um, everyone to go and, and read in their own time and explore in more detail. And also just to remind everyone that alongside the guide is a literature review, which is also really helpful. Um, Patience and, and Stephanie, if you're happy to, um, we'd love you to stay with us today. And if there are more questions coming through the chat, um, you'll be able to respond to them in, in your own time as well. But I think on that note, what we'll do now is we'll pass over to Dr. Wendy Rallingita, who is going to introduce our fantastic speakers for our panel conversation today. Um, so let me just bring up our screen again and we will return to Wendy. Uh, thank you so much, uh, Stephanie Patience. Um, thank you so much for walking us through the guide. Um, and I'm very happy to, to be able to introduce this, this um, wonderful set of panelists that we have that are going to share experiences from a number of different um, contexts. Um, so our first panelist is Dr. Benjamin Kata who is Dean of the School of Education at the University of Zambia, where he has also been a, has also been a lecturer in mathematics education since 1991. The School of Education is currently implementing a USAID supported transforming teacher good, education good, act. Good afternoon. Uh, sorry, I'm struggling to hear now. My, the audio is breaking and uh, I think about four times now I lost connection. It comes oh, back soon sorry. after. So I, I may be out of rhythm occasionally, but otherwise pleased to be here. Okay, thank you. Welcome. Um, and feel free if you if you need to turn off the video to save connectivity, um, you're welcome to do that. So I will go I will go ahead and introduce all of the panelists. And then I will after I have introduced all of the panelists, I will share some questions that I'll be asking um, each of you to respond to. 
Um, so as I was saying, uh, Dr. Nkata is, um, and I want to thank, you know, really uh, thank all the, the panelists for coming at various hours of the day and with uh, various levels of connectivity. I, I, we really appreciate the, um, the effort uh, and giving your time to be with us today. Um, the USAID activity that um, Dr. Nkata has been um, involved with in, in Zambia arose uh, out of an identified need for greater attention to pre-service teacher education to support reading. Previous to his roles at the University of Zambia, he taught secondary school mathematics, taught at a teacher training college, followed by a brief stint as a standards officer for mathematics for the Ministry of Education in Zambia. He holds a PhD in career and technical education from Virginia Tech in the US and has just completed a joint research project um, undertaken with Hiroshima University, the Ministry of General Education and JICA to investigate possible sources of the low mathematical performance in Zambian primary school learners. Um, our second panelist is Dr. Lorna Mina. She has been Dean at Bicol University College of Education in the Philippines since 2015. She is also currently serving as project director for a capacity building program in science and mathematics education through the Department of Science and Technology. She is engaged in research, having conducted research on assessment practices, curricular alignment, environmental education, project documentation, amongst other related topics. She also serves as a program advisor for the PhD in Educational Foundations, a learning tutor for a CMO Innotech online courses, and has spoken extensively on topics related to teacher education, science education, assessment curriculum, and instruction. Our third panelist, Dr. Benedicta Atiku, has over 20 years experience in pre-service teacher education in Ghana, having been a leader at various levels of the college system since 2000. Currently, she's the principal of Dambai College of Education in the OT region in Ghana, where she is heavily involved in community education development. She has spoken in many national and international fora and has won several awards for teaching. She was very active in the implementation of the Transforming Teacher Education and Learning Program in Ghana, a major education reform in initiative. And finally, our, our fourth speaker is uh, panelist is Dr. Matur Pangbai, who is an international education expert with 25 years of experience in teaching, school management, and education policy leadership in the United States and Liberia. Dr. Pangbai has advised Liberian education institutions on improvements to the delivery of quality education, providing professional development services to teachers and school administrators. He also served as the Deputy Minister of Education for Instruction for the Government of Liberia and has experienced working from kindergarten through grade 12 to higher education systems. Currently, Dr. Pangbai is the Technical Director for the Transforming for transforming the education system for teachers and students or TESTS program in Liberia. TESTS is USAID's new five-year pre-service teacher education activity in Liberia, working with eight higher education teacher training institutes to support two years of full-time study for 3,500 aspiring teachers. So welcome to all of the panelists. Um, we're going to have, I have a few questions that I'm going to ask you to respond to, and then a little bit later, we will open up to questions from the audience. To begin, I'm going to ask each of you in turn to just take a few minutes to share a bit about the context you're working with pre-service in the context that you're in, um, including some of, the, some of the key things, the things that keep you up at night, some of the challenges you face, um, and just to give us an idea of, of where you're working. So let's, if we can start with Dr. Nkata, um, and please share a bit about your context and some of the things that you face in Zambia. Thank you. Dr. Nkata? He was saying he has an audio problem. Dr. Nkata, can you hear us? You are muted, I think. Thank you, um, Wendy, I, I hope you can hear me. Um, I can barely hear you, but I can figure out that it's my turn to say something. Yes, please. 
Yeah, uh, I, I apologize. Uh, I'm really struggling to 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 get the audio. I, I hope the reverse is is all right. So uh, even when the question comes, I was not uh, entirely clear. But uh, I I guess that at this time maybe to say a little bit more about my institution, if I'm right. Um, my my university is uh, has a large faculty of uh, education, and uh, we have programs for both. A primary education and secondary. Uh, our impact is not so much by way of our own primary program where uh, literacy and humanities are taught, but in addition to that, we uh, have uh, a quality assurance role in a large number of colleges of education in the country, including all our public colleges, which are really the main contributors of teachers of literacy and the and the numeracy in, in Zambia. So um, uh, that's how we, our role really, our institution impacts on the, the issues of precedence training of uh, teachers of literacy uh, and, and numeracy. And uh, I'm privileged now that we are hosting a project that transforming teacher education, which we are glad to partner with Florida uh, State University. But again, knowing that I didn't quite get the question, I don't know whether I can proceed to speak to some of the issues that I uh, had anticipated you would wish me to raise or I pause here for now. Uh, I was barely able to get you. Maybe maybe we will pause from now for now. And um, when we come to the question uh, time, Wendy? I will try to put the question in chat. Um, and Alice, maybe you can help with. Um, Maybe I log sure out and try to come in again. Um, Alice, maybe you can help um, work with Dr. Nkata. I'll see up and leave the meeting and come in again. Great, I will message you, Dr. Nkata. Okay. Um, so um, now I'm going to move to Dr. Mina. Dr. Mina, if you can also share about your context um, what pre-service like is like in, in your context and um, maybe some of the some of the challenges and issues that you face okay good morning good afternoon and good evening um, I am the Dean of the College of Education of Bicol University in the Philippines and we are offering um, programs for the secondary education and the elementary education and then um, only around 10 years ago, we offered a program for early childhood education. Now, we are operating laboratory schools. Um, the, our laboratory schools are offering courses or programs from kindergarten to grade 12. So that is where our uh, pre-service teachers are having their practicum for the in-campus practicum, but we also filled them in the public schools and the department of education now for our aside from the aside from the baccalaureate program that we have we also offer graduate diploma leading to ma and preschool education and we had that for the last 10 years as well however lately uh, three years ago, we revised our program instead of having it as bachelor in elementary education major in preschool education, we have aligned it to bachelor of early childhood education. And with that, the, the coverage expanded to cover from uh, zero to eight years old. So that means the training of our teachers have to has to include the primary grades, the early grades, whereas before in our program in the Bachelor of Elementary Education major in preschool, the coverage was only the preschool period. So right now, aside from the Bachelor of Elementary Education, there is another program that will also cater to the needs of the teachers who will be assigned in the primary grades. Now we also conduct in-service trainings for teachers who are already in the field, particularly those who are not trained to be uh, teachers in the primary grades and in the kindergarten, but they found themselves 
teaching there. So we also conduct trainings to them. However, that is very seldom because the Department of Education takes care of the training of their teachers. So what we train are only those uh, who are enrolling in the diploma and MA in preschool education. So more or less that's how um, we do the pre-service education and at the same time in-service education for teachers. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Mina, for giving us an introduction to, um, pre to the pre-service program you're working with. Um, I'll turn it over now to Dr. Atiku, if you can share um, also about the context that you're working in. Thanks very much. Um, I'm Benedicta Ose Atiku, as already mentioned, principal of Dambai College of Education, a college that is located in the region of Ghana. We are a specialist teacher training institution accredited by the government of Ghana. We are one of the colleges among the 46 government established colleges. And uh, my college trains students in early grade education, that is early childhood, primary education, then junior high, secondary school education specialisms. This program is Bachelor of Education we also train uh, teachers on sandwich program, people who are already in service, coming for top-up programs linked with our mentor university, University for Development Studies. And so we build their capacity. Our college is, as we know, as a specialist institution, uh, has also gone through many reforms in the colleges of education in Ghana and duly benefited from the Transforming Teacher Education and Learning Project, a major initiative in reshaping pre-service teacher education in Ghana. And uh, in our contest, we feel that our students that are coming to the college are graduates of senior high secondary education with some background knowledge of English and mathematics. Therefore, I'm referring to literacy and numeracy in entering the college, we feel they still need a top up uh, skill, knowledge, and of course, pedagogic uh, knowledge in coming out as good teachers in teaching. And therefore, in our college, as, as practiced by other colleges of education in Ghana, uh, programs are mounted right from year one, where English, mathematics, science are compulsory for all newly enrolled students. This is to help them to be able to build their literacy and numeracy skill well, so that when they come out, when they graduate, they can be good or quality teachers in the classrooms of the Ghana basic uh, education system. And of course, uh, you, using seeing ICT as a, a tool for lesson delivery, attention is also given to our, all our fresh students in that area because we believe that in the 21st century education delivery, ICT is very key in good lesson delivery. If we are looking at, um, uh, we are looking at uh, collaborative, cooperative, we are looking at various ways of enhancing our teaching and learning. And therefore all these things as we, uh, uh, benefited from on the transforming teacher education and learning, we have incorporated all these things to make sure that the first year of our students in our college are built solidly to help them improve on their acquisition of literacy, numeracy, and general pedagogical skills in delivering lessons. And just as an overview, in the College of Education, a new curriculum that was introduced under the Transforming Teacher Education and Learning, working with the Ministry of Education, that curriculum was introduced in, in 2018. And that curriculum makes practicum very key part of the training of our students. If you look at uh, our former curriculum, our former curriculum had very few hours for practicum. But in the current curriculum, students do not less than 12 sessions every academic year. 
and therefore 12 sessions times four years to build their competencies in the actual classroom teaching. Just, this is just to give an overview. Our college staff, we know with updated knowledge will be able to deliver better. And therefore the Ghana government has uh, helped by the project, the CITEL project has also initiated one and a half hours compulsory com professional development session for every tutor. In addition to that, the country, the government has made all mentoring universities uh, to organize beginning continuous professional development session for all college academic staff, that is faculty. So it is just an overview. We currently have a student population of 956 here to bring in new students. Uh, in in a gist, that is the overview of our college. Thanks very much. Thank you so much. And I appreciate the hearing already some uh, initial ideas about some of the changes that have taken place, some of the uh, improvements that have been made. And I look into look forward to digging into that a little bit more um, during this, this session. Um, and so uh, we'll let the move to the last panelist now, Dr. Pungbai, if you can please share a bit about the context you're working in and, and some of the issues that you're facing or working on. Thank you, Wendy, and uh, thank you to my colleague panelists to, to join you to discuss uh, pre-service teacher education. I, I will play multiple roles. So I, I will discuss Liberia in general and how the structure of the pre-service education system is. Uh, currently, the government has three rural teacher training institutes that provide and qualify teachers uh, as a C certificate holder, it means that you can work up to grade six. And also they give you a B certificate and you work up to grade nine, uh, seven through nine. We have the uh, primary junior high system. Additionally, uh, you have uh, private and fit based institutions as part of the, the cohort of trainers uh, in, in working with uh, the students. Uh, pre-service students and qualifying them. Uh, interestingly, in 2011, there was a new law passed referred to at the 2011 Educational Act that was extremely uh, revolutionary. Uh, it indicated that uh, a bachelor degree was required, but then the government acknowledged that they, they had uh, challenges uh, uh, in, in ensuring that majority of the folks who were currently in the sector Will, will, will provide opportunities to catch up. Uh, the universities, uh, since 2016, uh, I, I began to provide uh, degrees now in early childhood education. Prior, it was pre-primary. It was a joint degree offer at that level, but that has changed. So uh, my current role, uh, you know, having worked in the sector from, uh, 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 it is unique because uh, the project is focused on building skills for, for, for quality education with emphasis on early childhood and primary. We'll be working with tertiary education uh, across uh, six geographic counties uh, in Liberia. Uh, and we'll be offering uh, the tertiary education opportunity to, 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 to graduate, uh, students ready to work with associate and or bachelor, either at the ECE level and or the primary level. Uh, based on current research, uh, we, we, we will be doing the development of co-curricular with the, with the eight colleges of education uh, looking at ways in which we could bring in uh, new practices and strategies, uh, universal design of learning, uh, social emotional uh, learning. Uh, we'll also be looking at inclusive uh, discipline and gender education focus. So this is to equip uh, the teachers that when they exit uh, the program, they are able to support the students that they teach. 
but more importantly, we've been working with uh, the colleges of faculty to ensure that they have the skill set to provide the kind of instruction that it is required uh, for the library education system. Another thing is that uh, research has approved it and, and, and uh, the literature review uh, confirmed that uh, provide opportunities to aspiring teachers or teacher aspiring from the onset of the program is the way in which you can uh, begin to scaffold their interest, build the kind of skills that they will need to be successful. So part of the work would be to ensure that uh, the, the classroom, uh, uh, the educators will be uh, student-centered, i.e. Uh, the traditional model will be uh, something of the past in our, you know, at our different colleges, ensuring that a student can model, uh, you know, can get involved in micro work. Uh, simply put, we'll be encouraged uh, service learning, a service learning component that, that provides provide an opportunity to work both in school and out of school beginning semester one. Uh, particularly, uh, we'll be working with our college of education to build a network of demonstration schools that, that they will work with the project, will be selected in a collaborative way. Both the colleges and demonstration schools will be supported to create the kind of learning environment that we expect uh, uh, high impact learning to occur. Uh, additionally, uh, the issues regarding literacy and numeracy cannot be overemphasized. So on our project, uh, every uh, new entrant into the program will, will have to do the rapid intake assessment that is, that is focused on foundational literacy and numeracy. Uh, and we'll use that as a baseline. We we'll have a tracking portal. Uh, and part of the baseline data will, will be used to develop individualized uh, learning plans, simply put IEP to support all of our students. And those who are struggling uh, in either literacy or numeracy or even both will be provided opportunities with micro courses that will, sub, that will supplement or, some, or supplement our work that they will, they will have to do in our courses. So the, so the project focus is to ensure that all of our students, as to whether you have physical challenge, as well as the issue around gender, as well as the issue around women, uh, we are taking a holistic approach to capture all of the students to make sure, to make sure all of our, uh, our graduates do have the kind of skill sets uh, that they will affect the library educational system. Uh, another thing we we'll do under the project is that we we'll build a linkages with uh, uh, exemplar teacher colleges around the world, the US, West Africa, et cetera. And uh, we'll provide opportunities to our faculty and, uh, and school leadership you know, to visit uh, as well the Rose Scholar, uh, uh, Fulbright, et cetera, et cetera. So we are research driven uh, and based on the lot of work that RIT has done, we, we want to make sure that we can succeed and, and, and help the government like we become successful. Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, and I really appreciate it. I, I muted myself instead of unmuting myself. Um, I want to thank you all for, for giving us an idea of the, 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 what you're working on in your institutions, um, and particularly already giving us some insight into some of the, um, the efforts you're making to strengthen pre-service. Um, and on that note, I'd like to um, come back to um, uh, Dr. Atiku. You, you started talking a little bit about some of the, the efforts that have been made in Ghana. And you know, as we, as we know from the presentation on the, on the guide, that um, there is a body of literature, there's, you know, there's research gaps, but there is still some evidence on um, what, what can benefit most in pre-surface um, teacher education. So I'd love to hear you talk a bit more about how you have applied evidence in research um, in the work that you're doing, um, and, and particularly if there's particular challenges that you have used uh, research evidence to try to address in your work. Dr. Atiku?
Uh oh, it looks like the connection may have gotten not so good. Can you hear us? Hello. Are you, were you Hello. able to hear? Uh oh. Auntie Wendy, yeah, light, light went, light went off at our place. Oh no! Disconnecting. Please, can you? Hello. Yes, uh, it's a little bit choppy. Hello. Yes, it seems like you're yes, back on. Yes, light now. went off. Oh. Okay. Fail, power failure, making the uh, internet go for uh, for for a time. Okay. That, that, that was my challenge. Yes, I so I couldn't hear you. I only heard your the latter part. Okay. Sure. So let me repeat what I was going to say was um you you talk you started to talk already uh, already a little bit about the um the work that you've been doing to strengthen pre-service teacher education for foundational literacy and numeracy. And um I was just asking whether you could talk a little bit about how you use research evidence, because one of the things in the guide, of course, we, we were presenting some of the research evidence on pre-service. Um, if you could talk a little bit about um, how you use, uh, have been using research evidence in the work you've been doing, and maybe also if there are specific challenges that you were able to use research evidence to address, um, you know, as you work to strengthen pre-service. All right, thanks very much. Um, as mentioned in my introductory remarks, the country conducted research through transforming teacher education and learning with the Minister of Education, and it was realized that our the then curricula was too bookish, was too examination oriented, lacked creative approaches to lesson delivery, and practicum was too less. And therefore, out of the findings of that uh, Minister of Education research, the country redefined its curricula for pre-service teacher education. And so a new curriculum was therefore initiated by the Minister of Education and implemented. That brought about the four-year Bachelor of Education program in early childhood education specialism primary education specialism, junior high school education specialism with mathematics in the context as a specialized area, English language also taken as a specialized area to improve literacy and numeracy skill building for our student teacher trainees. And that research has also led to the introduction of creative approaches, creative approaches to teaching, which is more learner-centered in the literacy, in the numeracy, in the sciences, and other related subjects. And that had emphasis of four R's, four, four R's. The four R's, we have, what the first R as reading. The second R is writing after small uh, capital, uh, after small W, you have writing as the R. The third is arithmetic. And the, the fourth is creative, creation. That is creative, creative approaches. And this curriculum, has given much emphasis to development of practical skills with involvement of practicing schools and their mentorship or mentors. We have the concept of lead mentor who is the head of a basic school where our students are assigned to and our teachers only serve, college of education faculty members only serve as link tutors who go to supervise occasionally, but our students start observation from year one of their program. We have what we call in beginning teaching. So in year one, the students have not less than 
six sessions to observe real life classroom teaching in literacy, in numeracy, and other subjects. In year two, they have what is called developing teaching. And there we have portfolio development. We have portfolio development and we have college teachers that serves as the uh, coach to these students in preparing them to go. Then in the third year, we have what is called embedded teaching, where students prepare with their mentors, observe, do some practical uh, lesson delivery. And in the fourth year, we have what is called extended teaching, where students go to the field, go to stay with the school, not less than four months calendar to do practical teaching. And our teachers and their mentors combine in supervising, guiding them in developing the final year, the final part of their skills as, pre, as teachers, as pre-service uh, curriculum teachers. Then in addition to that, the mathematics and English, because the country lays emphasis on numeracy and literacy, compulsorily students must pass English and mathematics in year one of their college life to be able to proceed to year two. If you are a student, you are not able to undertake and finish the good learning and develop good skills in year one, mathematics and English, you cannot proceed to year two. So assessment, of course, friendly, uh, uh, I mean, research-based forms of assessment are developed out of all these courses. And the transforming teaching, education and learning, teacher education and learning projects. Currently in my college, we have what we also call the, the right to play. The right to play is also another NGO in implementing play-based learning and teaching methodologies. All these are to help our students to develop practical teaching skills, making the classroom of literacy lessons, numeracy lessons, very lively, making the child to be playing around the concept. And out of that, the child learns without even knowing that he or she is learning, yet acquiring the necessary skills. So that is part of the, uh, the, the, the research. Another part talks about our teachers uh, uh, development of their skill and knowledge, updating. And that is what is linked to compulsory professional development session for every faculty member. All the national workshops meant to develop staff, that is colleges of education, faculty members must be attended by the targeted staff. And with this, all English tutors, all mathematics tutors, it is compulsory for them to attend the national workshop, for them to attend the university workshop, for them to attend the college-based departmentalized CPD sessions and share and also cascade and also partake in mentorship training. Research within the country, in fact, Ministry of Education through the Transforming Teacher Education and Learning Project has come up with a lot of findings. Concerning enhancement of the practicum, it was well established that every year, all our mentors must be retrained, must be retrained, especially in the uh, implementation of the new curriculum that is emphasizing development of literacy. In fact, talking about core, core course program, CCP, this involves literacy, numeracy, uh, religious and moral education, social studies, citizenship, ICT, and other related creative and uh, creative approaches and design. These are the issues that the current curriculum is addressing. And the first product of that curriculum are now in their final year, and it is, it has shown clearly the quality of the chicha we have developed out of this newly implemented curriculum. Our tutors capacity building in the past 
capacity building sessions looked like they were being punished. Currently, in the implementation of the new curriculum, our tutors have accepted the concept of continual self-development and improvement. And therefore, attendance to these workshops is no longer a border to our college tutors. We also enrolled our college tutors last year on a, a program, a nationwide program. The, the government supported that through Twitter. We took an online program with the uh, University of uh, Applied Sciences, uh, Amsterdam, where all staff members' capacity were built on blended teaching and learning. Blended teaching and learning so that amidst the COVID difficulties, our lessons, our teacher training programs could go on uninterrupted or not so much interrupted. In addition to that, we enrolled Dambai College of Education. Thanks very much. I, I might ask you to hold I, some I of that. There's so many exciting things <laughs> to share, but I want to make sure we also have, yes. have time to hear from the others. I really appreciate all of these things that you have shared. It really, to me, brings alive the, the concrete examples of some of the things that Stephanie and patients were, were talking about, the, the importance of the practicum and hearing exactly how you've gone about that, the professional development for the faculty at the, at the, the schools of education. I think I, I, it's really wonderful to hear the concrete examples of that. I really appreciate it. And, and we'll come back to you for, for more details, but I want to also give the other panelists a some chance to share their, right. their exciting. All right. um, All right. All right. Thank you so much. Um, I am going to turn now to Dr. Mina. Thank you, thank you. Um, thank you so much and stay here because we will we will have question, more questions and more time to talk. Um, so Dr. Mina, I'd like to ask you, um, you had mentioned that one of the things that you are sort of involved in both pre-service and in-service um, teacher support. And I was wondering if you could talk a little bit about the alignment, sometimes there can be challenges in aligning pre-service and in-service. So I, I was wondering if you could talk a little bit about some of the efforts that you have made um, in pre-service and particularly connecting those things. Okay, thank you very much. Um, first, uh, in-service and in-service uh, training of our teachers are of the same objective, that is, to ensure that the teachers are competent and, and uh, skillful in handling the early grades. Okay? However, um, there are some, uh, some there are some differences, there are some misalignment. Like for example, for the in-service, it's a uh, rigorous training because they have to train for a long period of time. Whereas for the in-service, sometimes they are short-term courses or short-term trainings that only a portion of the competencies are actually uh, covered by the in-service uh, trainings unless they enroll in the diploma or masters in preschool education okay? so that's another another uh, difference another um, thing that i can uh, i can I identify is that in most pre-service trainings the, the focus is on the theory and the content and the theory of how the literacy and numeracy is taught okay however in the in service they now focus on the actual teaching of literacy and numeracy in the early grades because they are there already they are in the real situation whereas in the pre-service it's more of ideal Okay. What was found? What is found in the references? That's what the students usually uh, know. Whereas in the in-service, they are there in the real situation, and they and then they address the situation as they see uh, fit. Okay. <clears throat> so in a way, the in-service, uh, the pre-service training is um, more of theory laden, whereas the the in-service training. That, uh, that they have, where, where, uh, which are actually the short-term courses, are more on focusing on the how to teach it. However, 
uh, lately we are trying to bridge that gap. We are trying to make some uh, modifications in our curriculum and in our mode of delivering the curriculum by ensuring that our pre-service teachers will also have the balance of theory and practice. Like for example, in the delivery of the specialization courses, aside from discussing the theory, aside from discussing the concepts, we also allow them to experience what they are learning in class. Like for example, if they are talking about pedagogy, um, they apply the pedagogy in their own home with their own siblings and then afterwards they bring the experience they describe the experience in class and that becomes a, a a topic for discussion as they analyze the experience and then the other members of the class learn from the experience of one student so in a way we are trying to uh, to bridge that gap another is <clears throat> We are also involving the, the in-service teachers by inviting them as um, speakers in a certain course. We enhance the course such that, such that there is that this pre-practicum. We're in, in this pre-practicum, we invite in-service teachers. They interact with our pre-service teachers they discuss about how uh, teaching is in the actual setting. So in that way, aside from the experience that our pre-service teachers get from the community and from their homes, they also get to interact with actual uh, in-service teachers and they talk about how they do uh, things, how they teach the little children. Now, what are the challenges that um, we have uh, met along this line. Okay. Um, first, we do not. Um, it's very difficult for us to uh, to really encourage the best students in the ACE program. So that is one problem that uh, we encounter most of the time. It is the least subscribed program. Now, when we asked our, our pre-service uh, teachers, they said that uh, they prefer other courses, they prefer other profession, or if ever it's teaching, they prefer the elementary or in the high school. So we really have to encourage them further to really love the ECE and take the, the program as it is. Another uh, in a Another challenge that we have is we do not have so many teachers who are really uh, qualified educationally to teach in the ECE program because for us it is a young, uh, a young program okay? and very few institutions here are really offering the early childhood education. Most of the schools here are offering the elementary education. And so we have difficulty really hiring the faculty or the teachers who are really graduates of the early childhood education program. So most of our faculty are just having the training, but not really the baccalaureate degree. Then another, another um, challenge is that it's difficult to contextualize the teaching of early childhood with references that are foreign. Since the, the program is a bit new, we have not yet developed the materials that will uh, show contextualized or experiences in the local setting, more of foreign references. And so the situation is different when we are talking about uh, foreign classrooms. So that's another difficulty. And luckily, we are thankful that uh, we are being uh, supported by RTI along that line, uh, developing instructional materials. And so our teachers are uh, developing these materials. And in the process, they are already integrating local experiences of the pre-service teachers and local experiences of the teacher educators themselves as they uh, teach their own children. 
So more or less, that is something that is uh, closer to the experiences of our pre-service teachers. Although the theories will be the same as those foreign uh, references, but the examples, the situations, the context will be closer to their own uh, experience. So that's, um, that's a good thing because that will help our uh, pre-service uh, teachers. Okay. Um, another challenge is the mother tongue, the use of the mother tongue, because in our place, um, there are so many dialects. Even if you, have, you, are only, you go only to the next town, there is another dialect. And so the challenge is what dialect or what language are, are they going to use? So most, um, most of the time, they make use of the national language or the language of the region, but some of the children may not understand them because their mother tongue, of course, is the local uh, dialect. But the teachers, the pre-service teachers, have a different uh, mother tongue. So that is another challenge that we have. Okay, so what else? No, for the use of, uh, for, uh, sorry. I was going to say we can leave it there, but if you have one more point to share, and then and then after that we can move on. Ah, I was about to say that for the in-service uh, training, um, we are not actually much involved in the in-service training that are offered by the department. What what we are involved in are the in-service trainings in the um, diploma and graduate education. And of course, training of the child development workers or those involved in the education of the preschoolers. Okay. Okay. Thank you so thank much. You. Yeah. Yeah. Again, a lot of really great examples for for um, really how to how to to link the theory and practice and how to move to toward a more practice oriented. Um, teacher pre-service program. I, I really uh, appreciate hearing all those examples. And on that note, um, if we have, if Dr. Nkata is, is able to hear, or if Alice can help with um, jotting the, um, the question in the chat, I'd like to hear from Dr. Nkata also about um, the idea of misalignments, um, anything that, that, that he has to share on challenges around the you know how pre-service links or doesn't link to the actuality in the the classroom and the larger system what some of the challenges may be what they may have done in the program there in order to address those challenges um can you hear us now dr Nkata? i'm happy to say yes uh Plan C is working a lot better now so wonderful wonderful <laughs> i, I can you. get you uh, again, accept my sincere apology for the mishaps that uh, uh, I had uh, earlier on. Um, thank you. Yes, um, misalignment between the pre-service education curriculum and the school curriculum uh, has been a big issue for us. I, in theory, I think there is no issue uh, in design of the curriculum. It takes into account what Elaine has expected uh, to do in primary school. On the implementation, I think that's where the issues are. And uh, I, I've summed up our issues of uh, misalignment around the issue of uh, authenticity of the pre-service training program. One is the, the issue of theory versus practice on a number of fronts. Uh, the teaching in the college and university is uh, too theoretical. Uh, do what I say rather than what I do. In other words, our student teachers don't have the opportunity to see us do that which we are asking them to go and do. So um, that is one point of, uh, of disconnect. A second one is the issue of pedagogical content 
uh, knowledge without preempting the uh, how to guides which reflect uh, on it. So we have courses which deal with content. We have courses which deal with pedagogy. What we don't seem to be doing well enough is how to blend this in a sufficiently meaningful manner that it helps the teacher facilitate learning in class for, children, for the teacher to be able to help children learn. And related to that, I think that our concern has been more with teaching. We don't orient our teachers sufficiently to say that teaching is by the way. Your destination is children learning. If as a result of your teaching, children can learn, we are grateful. Say, for example, they were to learn and we haven't taught, we would still be grateful. But teaching is only as useful as it causes learning. But I don't think our processes take the student teachers to that extent, that you are not just there to teach, but to facilitate learning. And just as an illustration of that, um, until recently, uh, the instruments we use for assessing peer teaching in the, in, the, in the college, for assessing peer teaching when they're on practicum, have been the same, irrespective of subject, which, which doesn't make much sense. I can't use the same instrument to teach, to, to observe a literacy lesson. Uh, the same one to observe a home economics lesson means something is amiss. Uh, it, it means we are not paying attention to the learning processes, to children's learning, focusing more on the teacher theatrics, what the teacher does. Uh, is the teacher speaking well enough? Is he writing well enough? Uh, so the focus on teaching, inadequate attention to, to learning. If we did that, then we could see that to observe a literacy lesson it cannot be the same instrument as observing a numerous lesson, uh, an art lesson. So that is a, a, another point of, of, of disconnect. Another point of disconnect in, in, in my opinion is uh, on the approaches to learning. So sometimes, um, Maybe these are the consequences of, uh, of poverty sometimes, you think. Um, initiatives in the way we teach change. For example, language may change an approach to the teaching of language, and we have had no shortage of that. Um, the primary reading program, we have had the new breakthrough to literacy. Well, so all these changes are happening, and usually with support, uh, by way of uh, in-service training so that you can uh, update the knowledge and skills of serving teachers uh, on a large scale. But that initiative will not simultaneously be happening at pre-service level. So it's like uh, you went to a shopping mall, uh, left the tap running and you come back to find your house flooded and you start mopping uh, before identifying which tap is leaking so that you close the tab first uh, before you start working. So sometimes our interventions have taken that route that we are addressing a phenomenon that we'd like to see, an approach to teaching that we'd like to see, but it failed to do it simultaneously between uh, what we want to see in practice and what the training process should bring. So teachers come out of college in need of retraining on day on on day one uh, regarding numerous specifically uh, that's an area closer home to me it is um, much more concern for children finding correct answers not sufficient attention for children to think to reflect to explain why um, even if the answer is is, is correct, and we have recently concluded a study of understanding children's thinking processes, uh, whether they can see structure uh, in, in, in the things. Um, 
up to quite advanced grades, not just lower primary school, you give them a number of things to, to add or keep counting one, two, three, four, they will not see that this is a group of 10, 10 there for this, uh, that this works, this works, but this works better. Um, so we pay inadequate attention to children's thinking processes. And based on that, to see how best we can advance Oh, shoot. Uh, okay. They're they thinking. Um, we, we have the issue of language of instruction in Zambia. We have had a very confused scenario where initially it was the English as a medium of instruction right from the beginning. Uh, so that had the challenge of learning English and learning in English. We recently changed to the local language, but the challenge coming with that one was that uh, the curriculum was not sufficiently developed to be able to teach in the local language. But secondly, there isn't enough experience while in college to be able to use the local language as a, a means of structure. I said, we go to colleges to see the coursework. You, you look at what has been done, you don't see sufficient attention to a crucial curriculum area which would be a major challenge for most of them, uh, made worse by teachers going to areas where they're not local language speakers uh, themselves. But you, you don't see the training program sufficiently addressing this issue, which they will confront once they are in school. So uh, that's why I say the, our issues are at curriculum implementation. And sometimes we are superficial in the way we deal with the, the teaching and training process, when they go to school, they'll find classes of 80, classes of 90, but we train them as well, they'll meet classes of 10, and classes of five. So the authenticity of the teacher training process, I think we have big issues there, which cause this disconnect between what we do in teacher training and the reality that the teachers will find that. Are there issues of practical? Maybe we'll come back later when we to, to deal with the how to guide. Again, the management of that component, uh, much more so in my university, uh, leaves a lot to be desired. <laughs> You'll be questioning why we are not doing anything about it, even when we know that we have an issue with it. But there are all sorts of institutional factors that constrain sometimes doing that which you know to be correct to do. So the, all these things are so intertwined that even when you know the solution, implementation becomes a, a, an issue. I'll pause there for now and, and listen. Thank you very much, Wendy. Thank you so much. Um, yeah, there's, there's. Well, I'm also a math teacher at heart, so there are a number of things that you said that I was vigorously nodding my head. You know, it, um, having pedagogical content knowledge that that is um, focus subject specific, both in terms of the the you know observing the practicum as well as in is instruction that you know what you do the pedagogy you use in literacy is going to there's going to be differences in numeracy and the developing the conceptual understanding i was i was um excited to hear about that because i'm a math a math person as well but i really appreciate i i really like the idea of authenticity i love that way of thinking about um what do we need to be doing in pre-service to make sure that that those students will come out um, and really thinking about not setting it up so they have to be reoriented already because you're doing a new program in, in, in service and leaving pre-service again. I, I thought that was also a lot, so many, so many important points you made. I, uh, thank you so much. Um, we're going to, um, now I'm going to give the floor to Dr. Pangbai. And um, there's so much that's already been mentioned. I'd really like to invite you as someone who's now working in a, a program to support um, uh, teacher service in, in Liberia and trying to look at how to help um, improve the system there, I'd love to hear your reflections on um, what has stood out to you of things that have been mentioned as challenges as well as solutions, um, but also reflecting on the guide. If there's things you know taken as a whole, some of the things that stand out to you, um, both in terms of challenges and potential solutions and things that maybe you're doing in Liberia in that regard. Thank you, Winnie, uh, uh, Wendy. I, I will start with the word authenticity that uh, my colleague mentioned. Uh, you know, our own experience has been uh, a serious disconnect between what is it uh, 
students in the classroom are expected to learn and, and, and to demonstrate. Uh, majority of the work regarding uh, national curriculum are not even fed into the pre-service pre, the pre curriculum. So as the result, you have uh, teachers that come into the classroom not even knowing what is it. Uh, many of times they have not even seen uh, 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 the national uh, uh, curriculum. So part of the work, uh, and, and this is a great opportunity, that there has to be a conversation regarding ministries of education, uh, the regulatory body that is over tertiary education, and, and but, but more importantly, uh, uh, teacher education. The whole idea of content, and content practical, joyful knowledge uh, are great, but if we, if we got to be authentic, the outcome that everyone see is our student performances on uh, on the high stick examination. Uh, as a project, uh, this is a great tool because we are tax with the development of a new core curricula for ECE and 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 and, and primary. So uh, the, the project design and the folks uh, from Mississippi State University will be working with the colleges. Uh, we have captured uh, research-based evidences that are critical to, to, to ensuring that when teachers uh, are, are qualified, they walk into classrooms uh, on day one, able to do the kind of work that they need to do. So the issue around uh, 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 modeling, uh, if I use the word uh, service learning from the start, the, the issue of getting uh, teacher aspiring into classroom uh, as well they are helping struggling students uh, uh, in, in the ECE classroom or even uh, in the primary classroom reading uh, uh, and, and, getting to, and getting the fee of the profession they have chosen is critical. And again, uh, you cannot overemphasize the rule of practicum. It has to be continuous, it has to be intentional, and, and it has to be a, a reflective. I mean, I could come into the classroom and, and, and assume that I've done the right thing. So we need the kind of mentor teachers that are also qualified and trained to support uh, 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 the student teacher, the teacher aspiring that will have the opportunity to go into the classroom. And, and so you have the, the, the university educator also being trained to, to provide a kind of robust support to the, to the teacher or the teacher student. And that goes into uh, the, the practical demonstration school. But uh, most often you have a disconnect between what is happening in the schools and what is happening in the different colleges. So there has to be a collaboration between uh, demonstration schools and the colleges and, and a conversation regarding curricula. Because I mean, you could have uh, an excellent teacher, uh, a mentor teacher, but if the mentor teacher is not aware of what is happening in the university classroom, then, then, then the, the student teacher will see uh, up front the disconnect. So as a project, uh, we are noting the great suggestions that our colleagues are making. And, 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 and we are looking forward you know, to having a conversation, uh, especially sharing the, the how to guide with our, with our, uh, our, our, our colleagues. To, to make sure that we, we capture uh, those things that we need to capture to, to, to support the library education system. And if I may add, uh, early on, early grade reading, uh, uh, begin, begin the buzzword, uh, and I'm sure it's the derivative of the literacy we're talking about, that will infuse uh, 2010, 2011 uh, at the Teacher Training Institute. Uh, but how be it, uh, it, it is a fact, you cannot deny it that most of our potential teachers don't have the kind of skill sets to be successful. So ensuring that you have the uh, systems to, to, to uh, uh, assist uh, potential teachers that enter into teacher colleges are critical. Uh, you, can, you can leave the student to chance and you can't leave the, the faculty to change, neither can you use the actual classroom to change. So building the support system uh, that is revolving, that is real in terms of data collections, 
uh, uh, individualized plan as well as for the faculty, as well as for the students, uh, building the skills of the practical site. Because many a times uh, in the old system, a student will go and find his or her own site to, to, to practice, but that is in our past. So as we try to equip uh, our students with the uh, skill sets, uh, making sure that all of the students, not just some of the students, uh, are, are effective in the learning environment. Uh, uh, I look forward to, to listening and uh, I'm taking notes and I'm excited of the opportunity to be part of this wonderful experience. Thank you so much. Um, yeah, I'm just, I'm just looking at the clock and wishing that we had two more hours because this I, I, you know, I, we really have just hit the tip of the iceberg. I, I mean, I guess I said we're launching a conversation and um, we definitely, it definitely has to be con continued because I feel like we just got started, um, but we are running against the, the time. Um, thank you all so much for um, sharing about the, the different experiences that there's, I, I found it very interesting, the commonalities, you know, the, the connection, the need to support the faculty at the, the teacher colleges, the idea of authenticity. Um, I, I, I've just been really inspired by um, understanding the challenges, but also all of the great efforts that's being made to address them. Um, I'm going to turn it over now. There are, um, we've asked all of the panelists to try to um, type answers to some of the questions that are coming in the Q&A since we don't unfortunately have two more hours to discuss. And so I'm going to turn uh, back over to Alice. Right Thanks, now. Wendy, and, and thank you again, um, all of our panelists. It's, I think something that for me has been a real, um, you know, benefit of this virtual world that we increasingly find ourselves in is, is the ability to dip into all of these different contexts and um, be able to explore the, the, the work that, that people are doing in different parts of the world. So just thank you very much to all of the panelists and to Wendy um, for sharing and, and to everyone who contributed over the chat and, and the QA. Um, there were some really interesting things coming up in the chat around the role of micro teaching, kind of pre-practicum experiences, which give teachers the opportunity to build their confidence before going into the classroom, the role of technology and how it, it might facilitate that. We also had conversations about some of the, um, you know, the importance of, of monitoring and observation and giving really constructive feedback, as well as motivation as a theme that, that's come out across all of our discussions today. So I really thank you for engaging. Um, we are approaching the end of, of the session. Please don't dial out yet, though. Um, I would like to take a few moments of your time to hear from you about your thoughts on the session and if you read it, the guides as well. So we're going to share a very quick survey. It's really quick. It's really easy. You can access it on the QR code here. Alternatively, um, the link, I believe, is in the chat. Um, for you to click into. Please do take just a couple of minutes now. I'm gonna play some music before we wrap up um, for you to fill that survey in. We really appreciate it. Um, and and our, our, our ask of you is that, that you take that time to share with us your thoughts. So I'm just gonna play some music for a couple of minutes before we close the session.
me one more minute. Okay, hopefully everyone's had a chance to fill that in. If you haven't completed it, um, keep it open and make sure that you submit um, before, before you finish and move on to other things today. Um, as I've mentioned, this event is part of a series of events launching different RTI guides on the science of teaching foundational literacy and numeracy. And our next event is going to be on the teaching of maths and will be held early in the new year. So do look out to that. Um, final just a big thank you to everyone for participating that's everything from me but I'm going to pass over to Wendy for the last word before we finish and, and let you all go today Wendy um yes thank you all I just want to take a moment to again thank um thank the authors who came here to take give us a, a bit of a walkthrough on the guide as well as the panelists it's been such a rich conversation I really appreciate um the time as everyone has taken um, in the middle of the night for some. So I, I, I really appreciate that. Um, grateful again to the Gates Foundation that has made this possible, both the development of the guide and, and this forum. And as I mentioned at the beginning, we see this as a, a launch of a discussion. Um, the websites that Alice has uh, shared the links to and the QR code has the guides, of course, that you can take and look through, but we're also looking at developing a space there that we can continue in, in the engagement and the discussions around these important issues that we touched the tip of the iceberg um, today. And I really look forward to continuing this conversation. Thank you all for coming. Thanks everyone and have a fantastic um, end of your year.